young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord are not among your faith. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the, the fear of the Lord. Oh, 
mercy. We call the God for your presence. Lord, would you come and stay? Would you come and dwell in this place?
have something in your heart you just want to pour out to me. man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongues from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. Huh. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their trouble, out of all their troubles. Let's not forget that word, all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him, him out of them all. Out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned.
we give you praise, we exalt you today. We declare your kingdom here in this place, in this town. We declare your lordship. Say your kingdom will never end. The increase of your, go of your government and peace. There will be no end, Lord God. Will you reign forevermore? You are highly exalted. You are worthy of the highest praise. All hail, King Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, God of gods, first and last, the living one. You are raised to life eternal, Lord God. And you've raised us for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give a shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. so good and so faithful. Amen. Lord, you, you let us set the time. It's amazing. We just say, okay, 10.30, Sunday morning, be there. And Father, you come and you meet with us and you make your presence known. Holy Spirit, you come and you move among us. And Lord, you're here now and we worship you and we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives Amen. and in our hearts. Amen for your kingdom power here because the kingdom of God is not a matter of words but it's a matter of power it's the power of God unto salvation the words of eternal life it's victory and overcoming all the troubles of the world yes we have troubles but you've overcome the world and we overcome with you Lord God thank you thank you I come because you desire me to come here. Yes. You desire my presence. We do, Lord. But I desire your presence to come and be seated at my side, at the right hand of God, and rule and reign over your own lives and over the lives of others. So I have much work for you to do. You are kings and priests. Take your place. Take your rightful place. Rule and reign in this world. Rule over the anarchy. Rule and reign over the enemy of your, your soul who is trying to destroy this world. These things are not of me. I have called you to overcome. I have called you to rule and reign. Come and take your place, my people. Rule and reign. You are the instruments that I will use to bring righteousness and holiness and justice into this world. Without you, they will not see it. Without you, they are blind. Without you, they are in deep, deep darkness and they cannot see. They cannot perceive. They cannot hear. They do not know. But it's my desire that they would know. That they would come to me to find the life, the life that is theirs for eternity. Fear not, my children, my people. 
everything that you need. I will provide. I will be your protection. You will lack nothing. Take your place. your ambassadors, we are your friends, Lord God. We are on your side and thank you that you are on our side. Lord, that you provide everything that we need for life and godliness. That you are the one who sustains us. You keep us, Lord. Moment to moment, you keep us. Every breath, from breath to breath, Lord God, you are in us and with us. Hallelujah.
Lord, we say, hear the call today. Hear the call to righteousness. Hear the call to stand and be counted in these days. Fear not. Fear not. The Lord says, fear not, for I am with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you, my people. So stand. Stand and be counted. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And the Lord is asking us to stand today, to not be ashamed, to not be pushed down, to not be shuffled aside by the lies of the enemy, but to stand in righteousness and truth in the salvation and power that he's put in us and to stand. Amen. Well, I think you've got more, Eileen, but um, I'm going to just say, um, listen, everybody who wants to stand and be counted, I'm going to invite you to actually stand up. Amen. I just stand up in the room here. Even Whoa. if people are watching on the internet, you're kind of lazing on your couch in here. Pajamas, take, like stand up now. Let's take a stand. Let's just do this symbolically. Yes. And if Sue needs help standing up, then let's give her a put her arm and her elbow there and help her to stand. It is not a prophetic and a symbolic thing as well. If somebody needs help to stand, then let's help them to stand Amen. so that we can Amen. stand in the name of Jesus. <coughs> and we will take our stand. Lord, we say yes, we will stand. Who is on the Lord's side? Yes. Who is on the Lord's side? We stand in the name of Jesus. And we stand and we raise up the shield of faith. We raise up the sword of the Spirit. We thank you for the armor that you provided for us, Lord God. And we say that no weapon fashioned against us will prosper. We extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy. We receive your healing. We receive your love. We receive your goodness. We receive your grace, Lord God. And we thank you that you've enabled us to stand. And having done all, we will stand. And Father, we stand for you. We will not stand for the works of the enemy any longer. Amen. We will not stand for the work of Satan in our homes, in our families, in our lives, in our nation. We will not stand for it, Lord God. And we ask you, Father, to come and heal our land, yes. heal our hearts, yes. heal our families, Lord God. Yes. Yes. Father, you said that we, we believe we would be saved in our whole household would be saved too. And so we thank you for that word, Lord God. And we call in those family members who are not on the right path with you. Yes. We call them to turn and pay attention, to come to Jesus. We stand for you, Lord God. We stand in obedience to your call and your instruction. We stand. Yes, we do. Otherwise, we're just going to sing it. It's, it's one of those... Um, it's one of those songs that sounds like, well, maybe it's not so encouraging, but it is encouraging because as the Word has said this morning to us, you know, the right, many of the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord uh, helps them to overcome every one. Lord delivers them from them all. And you know, the time has come for us, I believe, to know the deliverance of the Lord. This is kind of part of my message this morning, so...
Dennis, yeah, I'm well, so glad you're playing yeah, today. You That's yeah. good, man. <laughs> Brother, won't you let me be your servant or something? <laughs> hey, like, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I need coffee. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you like my T-shirt? Oh, it's our T-shirt, John. We the church. Yeah. 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 Hoo ha! <laughs> Come on, we the church. I, well, only one in, in the world exists that I know of right now, and this is it. So, um, 
France got me this, because I kept going on about it, right? So she finally wanted to just shut me up, I guess. <laughs> oh, this will, this will shut him up. Okay, we the church, I feel like we've got to take our stand and, yeah. and be the church yeah. and just go like, not we the north, not we the whatever it is, but we the church yeah. have all the power, we have all the authority, we have the name above every name, the name of Jesus, and he is on our side. And no matter what we're going through, no matter what the difficulty all is well because God is with us and He delivers Amen. us from all our troubles. Many of the troubles of the righteous, but God Amen. delivers us from them all. Amen, Amen. and Amen. Amen. Okay. Let me raise my pulpit higher. Here I raise my pulpit higher. That's how the hymn goes, right? Here I raise my pulpit higher. Oh, that's too high. Everybody got coffee that needs it? No. Uh, what? I'm okay. I'll be alright. That's too high. That's too high. That's really high, man. You'd think I was taller. You can always stand on the front door. You need a little soapbox here. Uh, that looks probably okay. Okay. Glory, hallelujah to God. He is amazing. I, it's a shame for the people who are not here. I feel sorry for them, really. Um, that's not a dig at anybody. Jane sends regards, and uh, she just she's just not on her feet yet properly, and so she just couldn't make it, but um, she'll be back. Okay, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this question. Why do we have that funny pile of stones at the front of the church here, wrapped up in chicken wire? I know I've talked about this before, but I'm going to talk about it again because I feel like it's time for that pile of stones to get bigger. I feel like it's time for this little pile of living stones to get bigger and that God is going to do it. And, uh, you know, we're waiting on him and it relies on him. I just want to confess to you that there's nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do, actually, either. Pretty much just me, but there's nothing we can do. To, to grow the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. So I was just looking through some notes I'd made in the past and um, I, I wrote a blog and started off. So we planted a church and then, then I actually have to correct yourself because you cannot plant a church. It's not really possible because Jesus planted the church uh, 2,000 years ago nearly. He planted it and he's growing it. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's us. We are part of the church. We're not the church, but we're part of the church. And it's a worldwide movement that bears witness and testimony to the glory of God, to his overcoming power, to salvation, to beating uh, death and sin. God has done it. He did it for us. He did it for you. He's good. Amen. 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 So... I'm getting the deja vu thing here. Joshua 22, not really. Um, well, I'll read this one. Joshua chapter 22. It's a fantastic story. Um, you know, the people of Israel, God called a nation to himself, named them Israel. And uh, he led them out of bondage in Egypt into a land that he promised to them. But they had battles on the way. Don't we all? Yeah. Tell me about it. We have battles on the way to where we're going. But God led them into the land. And eventually they overcame every enemy. They settled in their land in peace. So let's have a look. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Joshua, Judges. Uh, Joshua chapter 22. On the way... They took some land on the one side of the Jordan River and uh, the tribe of uh, Gad, I think it's Gad, Reuben and the half tribe of Manasseh, oh, we'll read it here. Let's just read it, shall we? Oh, again? Sorry. Joshua 22. 
It says, Joshua called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. He told them, you have done as Moses, the servant, the, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have obeyed every order I have given you. During all this time, you have not deserted the other tribes. You have been careful to obey the commands of the Lord your God right up to the present day. So what happened was, as they were taking the land and defeating enemies and taking the land that God had promised to them, these uh, two and a half tribes, what I'm looking at the ESV, I think. Uh, oh no, this is the New Living Translation. That also works. What translation would you like me to read it in? We'd like to read it in the same translation. Well, I, I'll go to, um, I was actually looking at it in the ESV, so let me go to it. But uh, I just want to explain. So what happened was these two and a half tribes, uh, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, were fighting with the rest of their people, but they came and they possessed this land, and that was going to be their land. And so it was already won. They already had it. But there was more work to do on the other side of the Jordan. And, and these uh, peoples said, uh, well, we're not, we're not going to just settle here and take this land that we've got because there's more land to take over there for everybody else. And we'll be with you in battle. and We'll fight with you until the time when the, all of the land is possessed that God has promised to, our, to us and to our forefathers. We're going to stay with you and we're going to fight with you. And we won't stop fighting until our whole battle is finished. And all the land is taken, and then we'll come back to our land. So they're at that point now. So Joshua get, gathers them together, and he says, You've done everything that Moses commanded. You've done everything that God commanded, and you've done what you said. That's a good place to be in. Mm -hmm. And now the Lord has given your God. I'm in verse 4 now, and I've switched to the ESV. Uh, Joshua 22, verse 4. Now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where you, your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. I just want to say in passing here, sometimes we've got to cling to God, haven't we? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it things like God is the last thing that we've got. Sometimes it, fe it, fe it feels like, uh, you know, we get to this des place of being desperate, and it's like we've just got to call out to God. But I think that sometimes God takes us to that place where all we can do is call out to Him. Because He wants us to rely on Him. He wants us to walk with Him and to, uh, to, to do the things that he said, to live the life that he's called us to. And like a pastor friend of mine used to say, God will get you where he wants you to be, the fastest way that you will go. And in fact, he had done that with the people of Israel, hadn't he? He'd taken them the fastest way that they would go. Because when they first spied out the land, right after they came out of Egypt, they sent some people in to have a, have a shufti, do you know that expression? No. <laughs> it's from a foreign country. It's from a land far away. They went to have a look, you know, to check it out, man. And they went, they sent some dudes to check it out. And they got over there and uh, saw it. And they saw that it was good and they got like massive fruit and it was just a great place. And they got back, but 10 out of the 12 said, oh, that's a massive place. But they're like, they're big there. They're scary. They're intimidating. I don't think we can do this. We know this is not going to work. I don't know how this is going to work. And they doubted and they had no faith. You know the story probably. And so they, they just said, oh, okay, forget that. Except for two. Caleb, right? And who else? Joshua. And doesn't Joshua end up being the leader of the whole people? And doesn't he end up leading them into this promised land that God has given to them? Isn't that awesome? Only those two. Uh, went in um, and so anyway they ended up going the long way but that was the shortest way that God could get them there I, you know I just always want to say go the way that God is leading you right away yeah. just go right away just, when God says jump just say well how high I can do that and you got to say I can do that I can do that because 
there's a there's a, a principle that when God gives you a command to do something, it's just implied that it's possible to do it. And with God, all things are possible. But if God tells you to do something, He's not asking you to do something that you can't do. He's not setting you up for failure. He's not trying to frustrate you. He's just asking you to do something that He needs you or wants you to do. Because it will serve His purposes, because it will serve the kingdom, because it will serve your brothers and sisters, or because it will be good for you. You know, those are the reasons God asks you to do stuff. And really, when you're doing things that serve and help your brothers and sisters... Oh, can you put that computer oh, back shoot. on? Sorry. When you serve your brothers and sisters, <laughs> <coughs> then it is good for you anyway, by default. Okay, where was I? So Joshua blessed them. Okay, so he says, Cling to the Lord, cling to Him and serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. This is the commandment from the Ten Commandments, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength. So, Joseph, so Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. And when I was reading this, I thought, well, what kind of a blessing is that? Um, when, uh, when you just say, well, do what God tells you, is that a blessing? But you have to read on. It says, to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half of Joshua had given a possession beside their brothers in the land west of the Jordan, and when Joshua sent them away to their homes, he blessed them. He said to them, go back to your tents, go back to your tents with much wealth and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze and iron, and with much clothing, divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. Well, that's a blessing. Joshua blessed them. Take all this, uh, take this uh, wealth. He blessed them with wealth, actually. He said to them, uh, I read that one, so I'm in verse 9 now, so the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned home, parting from the people of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, their own land of which they had possessed themselves by command of the Lord through Moses. There's land for you to possess by the word of the Lord, by the command of the Lord. There is land for you to possess and we've got to not be weary in well-doing. We've got to not give up pressing in to Him. And even though your pile of stones might seem really small, <laughs> keep on keeping on. You'll understand that in a, in a minute. Okay, so. Um, so they went and took possession of the land that they had possessed, of which they had possessed themselves by command of the Lord through Moses. It's a great story so far, I think, you know. It's like, it's almost like the happy ending, isn't it? You know, it, if it was a, a mini-series or even a long series, six seasons, like Downton Abbey, it would end with they came to the land that God had commanded them to possess through Moses. They were blessed, and each one of them went to their tents, and they lived in the land in peace. Amen. Roll credits. Awesome. <laughs> But there's a little bit more here. Uh, a problem arises, and that's what I want to get to. But it says, um, When they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size, something impressive, something remarkable. This doesn't look good. This is what the people of Israel thought. The people of Israel heard it said. They heard it said. Rumor. Word got around. So we don't really know the time scale in this thing. You know, we don't know whether it was days. It wasn't days, probably. Weeks later, months later, a year later, don't really know. But the people of Israel heard it and they said, Behold, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. So they built this huge altar on our side of the Jordan. Why have they done that? Um, and that when the people of Israel heard it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh, which is where they parted from the, the two and a half tribes, they gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. So now there's trouble in the camp and suddenly it's like the people of God are at war with each other. Hey, that happens too, doesn't it? Mm. I need coffee. <coughs> yes, Selah. Stop and think about that for a minute. 
They gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. But the people of Israel, verse 13, the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. I love the way that God doesn't leave anybody out. You know, he could, he could just shorten it up, you know, but he doesn't. He just said, he, he mentions them all. He said, sent to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, and with him, ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, each one of them the head of a family among the clans of Israel. So representatives of the whole uh, rest of Israel, basically. And they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, and they said to them, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What is this? What is this? What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the Lord? against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord, by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord. So they're concerned for, really, they're concerned that these two and a half tribes, sorry, I should say it, the tribe of Reuben and the people of um, uh, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, that they've gone against the Lord already. They've just gone off to their own land and they're doing their own thing. And so... You know, whereas the, the whole rest of Israel now is following the Lord, serving the Lord, trying to keep His commandments, they think that now this faction has gone off and caused division in the people, and they don't want that. So, you know, it's like, are you are you our enemies now, or what is it? it it's a rebellion against the Lord. It's an interesting thing through the Bible that often when people sin against another person, it's really seen as a sin against the Lord. Uh, one of the remarkable verses about that is where I think it's Samuel. I forget now, but he, say, he makes this comment: "Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by not praying for you." That's just you know, often when we do things or don't do things to the detriment of our brothers and sisters, church family, or the church generally, it's a sin against the Lord. It may be a sin against that person, but it's, firstly, it's a sin against the Lord. And that needs to be put right. If any of those things are outstanding against our credit balance, I know that's not a good, good way of expressing it. But anyway, if any of those things, those sins against the Lord are outstanding, we need to deal with them. Amen. Clean that up quickly. So, um, what have you done by building this altar this day in rebellion against the Lord and they asked them have we not had enough of the sin at Peor from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves and for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord that you too must turn away this day from following the Lord and if you too rebel against the Lord today then tomorrow we will be he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel see sometimes when we do this rebellion thing and we do this turning away from God and uh, it brings consequences on a much wider group of people, it's not just about us. But now, if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. It's really quite a, a gracious entreaty, isn't it? It's like if the land that you've inherited, the place where you've gone to dwell is unclean, why don't you come back? Why don't you come back and join us and we'll give you an inheritance out of the land that we've got? You know, they'd be, everybody would have to make their territory smaller. But it's a gracious invitation. Come back to the Lord. Don't rebel against Him. Come back and we'll give you an inheritance. We'll give you a possession among your people. Don't, if you don't have to stay there, if that place is unclean or there's something wrong with it, um, only do not rebel against the Lord or make us, make us as rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan the son of Zerah break faith in the matter of the devoted things and wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel and he did not perish alone for his iniquity? Then the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, so here comes the response. Let's see what they've got to say for themselves. 
The people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, the Mighty One, God, the Lord. We've been declaring that today, haven't we? The Mighty One, God, the Lord. He knows, and let Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today. For building an altar to turn away from following the Lord, or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it, may the Lord himself take vengeance. See, they were instructed to worship at the altar in the tabernacle that, they, that God had given instructions about, which was to become the temple. And only in that place, that's where worship, that's where the, 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 um, the mercy seat was, the place of the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, containing the commandments. That was the place for sacrifices and worship. <coughs> And they built this altar, so let the Lord himself take vengeance. No, but we did it from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben and people of Gad. You have no poor... Um, sorry, I'm reading it wrong. It's all the same question, right? So they, the children might come and say to the children, the descendants, right? What have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben and people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord. So your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. In other words, I, bet I can maybe say it in a way that I understand it. The descendants of the people on one side of the Jordan might look at the people on the uh, the descendants of the people on the other side of the Jordan and say, "Well, who are they? They're, like, they're not part of us. They've got this river in between us, and they forget that they were all one people, and they didn't want that to happen." Um, Therefore, we said, "Let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you, and between our generations after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord." In his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings so your children your descendants will not say to our descendants in time to come you have no portion in the Lord so it's actually built as a witness to say we serve the same God and we thought if this should be said to us or to our descendants in time to come we should say behold the copy of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice but to be a witness between us and you. Be a witness. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar for burnt offering, grain offering or sacrifice, other than the altar of the Lord, our God, that stands before his tabernacle. You know, there's an important message here because they're very emphatic about this. There is no other altar that is suitable. And in our day, we, the church, have a sacrificial altar that is the cross. And it's the only way to God. Nobody can build another way. Nobody can make an alternate, an alternative way. It's only through the blood of the sacrificial lamb, Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, that we can come to God. Only Amen. through Him. Amen. The cross is the altar. <coughs> there's only one. There's only one death, one substitution one sacrifice, one redemption, it's in Him. But sometimes people have a cross, sometimes in churches we put up a cross. It's not the cross. It's a witness. It's a memorial <coughs> to the sacrifice that was made. Need the glasses again. When Phineas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh spoke, it was good in their eyes. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, I think the war's off, right? Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is in our midst, because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the chiefs returned from the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan. 
to the people of Israel and brought back word to them. And the report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel. And the people of Israel, you know, let me just say this as an aside. I'm not really onto my notes yet, but because I wanted to read the whole story to get the whole context. But, um, you know, sometimes we're not very diligent in, with accountability, either on an individual basis or, uh, or on a, um, a, a wider basis, I guess, a, a to, you know, towards ministries. Um, and I think that sometimes, I think a, a good example of this and I want to distinguish between just running criticism constantly of other ministries, because that's come up in the last number, little number of weeks. You know that there are people who are making a career mm. and YouTube channels out of yeah. uh, out of just running down other ministries. And God said, if 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 they're not against us, they're for us. Mm. And so these ministries that are not against God, they're for Him, but they get run down by people who's making a career out of it. They're really joining with the accuser of the brethren. So I want to make a distinction between that. And it's interesting because, you know, I've heard people and people have asked me, well, who can we sing songs? Whose songs can we sing apart from Bethel and apart from Hill songs? And it's because Hill song, Hill song, right? And Bethel have been accused and attacked and judged and criticized by people, other believers and other parts of the body, they've turned on this part of the body and now there's friction and contention and strife and division instead of unity. And yet these songs that come from Hillsong and Bethel glorify God and house fires and um, yeah. all those different places where worship is just being poured out. And, and in the case of Hillsongs, I mean, has been for how many years? Decades. For yeah. decades. Just pouring out praise to the Lord that's gone around the world and glorified Him. So let's not be so quick to run them down and write them off. But on the other hand, accountability is something that we're not always good at in the church. And we can hold people accountable in love. You know, when the, uh, when the people from the ten tribes came to confront the people who had uh, gone into Gilead, into Canaan, they... Um, they brought a really gracious, loving offer to bring correction from what they saw as a bad situation. But it worked out even better because the explanation was good in everybody's eyes. They all just went, oh, this is great. This is good. They just built this thing as a witness to the fact that we're one people serving the same God. That's what that whole thing is about. So it's not a false altar. It's not an alternative. They're not rebelling. They're just bearing witness that they're part of one people. So... The report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel, and the people of Israel blessed God and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the people of Reuben and the people of Gad were settled. The people of Reuben and the people of Gad called the altar witness, for, they said, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. It is a witness between us that the Lord is God. So all of that, to get to my question, why do we have that kind of funny, hokey little pile of stones at the front of our room here? Uh, well, it's a witness between us that the Lord is God. That was, that was kind of what motivated me to set this up. You'll know probably that at various times as the people moved through the land, they would set up a pile of stones. I think in the center of the Jordan, they set up a pile of stones as they crossed over they set up a pile of stones and it was a, a, an act of remembrance of what the Lord had done and the goodness of God and the deliverance of God. And so in different, at different times they set up piles to remember God. And I thought, and, and because we want to be a ministry that is not isolated and not insulated and not closed within the four walls, but is looking out to the community and looking out to do missions around the world. That's what we want to be about. That's the calling that's on the church. Go into all the world and make disciples. That's what Jesus told to do. He didn't tell us to build a group of people here. He told us to go into all the world and make disciples. And we want to make disciples. And we want to be part. We want to work alongside and not in contention and strife and division alongside other churches, but in unity and in love and in grace. 
with other congregations. And so we've had this worship night meeting going on for a few years. Uh, we meet here um, for now. But we invite people to come from other churches to lead, help lead worship and to join with us and just worship the Lord and know that He, the Lord, is God. And so I invited people, and of course I haven't invited people for a long time now, but I invited people just as a witness to the fact that we are one, serving the one Lord. Bring a rock, bring a stone, and put it on the pile, and we'll call the pile witness, and let it be a witness that we're in unity, that there's one church, one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Let it be a witness. And so that was the idea. And, um, you know, it's, there's a few things about this. I got like four pages of notes to start on now. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> now that I got to the point of why do we have that little pile of stones at the front, don't worry, you're safe. The roast beef shall not burn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, no, I'm just trying to decide where to pick it up because I've covered most of it already, which is great. You'll be glad to know I covered most of it already. Yay! <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So why uh, is it important? You know, it's not exactly the same. We're not building an altar that's a model of the altar. We don't have the cherubim and the, the Ark of the Covenant, and the, you know, the, that kind of stuff. We don't have all that built up at the front here. It's just a pile of stones, a pile of remembrance, but call it witness. Uh, why is it important? Because there's only one people of God, and we may be in different places, and we may have some different customs, we may speak different languages, there might be different shades of beige or brown or whatever, uh, different colors, look different on the outside, but there's only one God, and there's only one people of God, and we're all one people. We're, we're a, a, a wall of the temple made out of living stones, and all the stones have got different colors and reflect the light in different ways, and the glory shines off us. And it makes this beautiful mosaic, this beautiful um, construction that, that Jesus is building. But there's only one God. So the other thing is that there is strength in unity. There's weakness in division. You know, a house divided against itself will fall, right? Scatter the sh uh, shepherd. Uh, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. If there's, if there's brokenness, if there's division, if there's contention, if there's strife, we're weak and we're not able to do the job that God has called us to do. And this is the reason, I think, a big part of the reason why the church has not resisted changes in society. And, uh, you know, now it, it's almost like, well, society has just kind of gone off on their own way. And whereas um, almost like the church was fairly close and fairly influential to the rest of society, which we should be, uh, because we should be taking the lead in matters of morals and life and godliness and law and what's true and what's righteous and what's proper the church should be taking the lead and speaking into the culture and influencing the culture and that used to happen and now it's like the church is kind of over here somewhere and the culture's moved on and uh, it becomes more ungodly all the time but i think that god can restore that uh, at least that you know we can still as the church stand as God instructed us to do today. It's time for us to stand and speak the truth and to hold out grace and say, why don't you come back and settle in our land? Why don't you come back and have an inheritance with us? Why don't you come back to God and serve Him and not rebel against Him? We need to call that out to the, to the society around us and out across the world and say, come and be His disciple and receive the goodness of God. Come to the river, come to the table, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we really need to remind ourselves that throughout the Bible, this is why I think it's important, God uses symbolism. And uh, he asked people, why did he say to the prophet, lie on your one side for how many days was it? 411 days or something like that? Like more than a year. Just lie on your left side and just lie there and don't say anything. And then when that was over, it's like, okay, now lie on the other side. More than a year. Just lie on your other side. And I'm like, What? <laughs> because God uses yes. symbolism. Why did he say to the prophet, go and marry an unfaithful wife, a wife of adultery? 
go and marry this woman. They had, the guy actually went and got married to her, really. It's not just a story. It's not, you know, say that you're going to get married, but don't really marry her. He actually got married to her. Why? Because God wanted to say to Israel, you've been unfaithful to me, like a wife is unfaithful to her husband. And so God uses symbolism and he uses actions, you know, as ways of expressing his truth. And so doing something sometimes means something, right? So that's another reason. So I thought, well, let's do something. And uh, so we built our little pile of stones there and we've done something. And it doesn't matter if we're just a little pile of stones. We're doing what God wants. But I do believe that God is going to, it's, it's time actually for the pile of stones to get bigger. That there's going to be an increase. The pile of stones is going to grow. And I encourage people, if you want to identify, if you're willing to say, yes, we're in unity with you. If you're willing to say, uh, yes, we're part of this one church. Bring a, a rock about this size and stick it on our pile and let's build the pile and make it grow and it will be more of a witness as it grows that we are one church, that we are one body with one faith, one Lord, one God and Father of us all. Bring a stone and stick it on the pile. And we'll just say, that's witness. That's witness. Um, there, there are other symbols that I thought about. You know, when Agabus, I think his name is, tied a belt around his wrists and said, this is how you're going to be led away. Mm -hmm. It was a way of demonstrating the prophetic word. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen to you. Um, why do we bow? Like sometimes when we're worshipping, I do. I know that there are other people who do. We'll just bow to the Lord. Why? There's nobody in front of me that I'm bowing to. That I, you don't see a person here. And I am not delusional so that I see a person when I bow in worship. But sometimes it's all I can do is just bow to the one, to the king. He's seated on his throne. He's high and lifted up. And he is worthy of worship. And sometimes, you know, worshiping the Greek word, one Greek word means kiss towards. It's like just prostrate yourself, humble yourself, bow to him. And so why am I bowing? There's nobody there. Who are you bowing to? Well, it's a symbol. I'm doing something that demonstrates a spiritual reality. And so we can be a people who are, who are demonstrative, who, who are active, who do something because it means something. And we can do that in small ways and we can do it in big ways. And the other thing about it is... God loves you and holds out this offer of grace Amen. to you. Amen. And like in the story, the invitation is there. If you're living in a land and it's evil, and it's unclean, you can come over and find an inheritance with us. I mentioned it once already. i, I got to give you an analogy. It's kind of disconnected a little bit from the story. Do you get this now? Yes. Like, does this make yes. sense to you? Yeah, we have. In some been. weird way, it makes sense. So if you haven't already brought a rock or a stone, then please bring one in and let's make that pile bigger. And if you uh, have never been here, why don't you come and bring a rock? <laughs> I'm just talking to those people through that little black hole there. And, um, come and bring a stone and set it on that pile and let it be a witness. Do you know uh, what diamonds are made of this is going to be my last thing but i just i re it's a little bit disconnected but i want to say it do you know what diamonds are made of coal well oh, they're made entirely of carbon entirely of carbon entirely do you and do you know what graphite is do you know what graphite have you ever heard of that yeah. you know yeah. what? they used to use it for lead pencils i think they use something else now it's not lead in a lead pencil have you got any lead in your pencil no i've got graphite and graphite, it's black and it's soft and it kind of breaks easily uh, and it's a rock. Uh, and so you can get rocks of graphite and it looks like coal. Coal is mostly carbon, but it has other stuff in it as well. Um, other bits and pieces, you could say impurities if you like it, not pure carbon. But graphite is pure carbon and yet it's black, soft. It's good for a few things. It lubricates locks. That's a carpenter's tip for you. Um, you can lubricate your front door if you rub a pencil on your key. You're welcome. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but is really soft and crumbly. But a diamond is also made of carbon, entirely of carbon, graphite, carbon, exactly the same material, totally different look, totally different condition, totally different value. I had this picture, it's like a symbol. But sometimes we, the people of God, and we, the church, <laughs> great t-shirt, thanks, thanks, friends. We, the church, <laughs> sometimes, I, I just got this picture, and it might represent a person just buried in the, in the, like the depths of the earth, the bowels of the earth, my parents used to say, buried in the bowels of the earth, just encrusted in rock, cased in and, and not able to move and just in this kind of sorry state you know and diamonds are created by pressure by they're created by um, a monumental event a really cataclysmic amazing uh, event that's full of all kinds of energy and in that energy which requires heat and pressure carbon the, the molecules the atoms realign in a different way and the only difference between carbon and a diamond is the way that the atoms connect they just line up differently between graphite and a diamond did i say that so the only difference between graphite and a diamond is the way that the, <coughs> the atoms connect so something happens and this pressure rearranges the atoms and suddenly instead of graphite of this soft black rock you've got a diamond in you know which is which is uh, potentially just brilliant and hard and sharp and valuable and I thought there's a contrast here there's a symbolism here I wish I had the two a piece of graphite about that big and a diamond about that big yeah that would be awesome <laughs> <laughs> and I'd, I'd show them to you because it would be like a, an, an objective an object lesson you know and so I'd say look this black soft and you know it's so soft you can drop it on the floor and break it but the diamond you drop it on the floor and it breaks the floor um, you know? and so um, and it, this diamond they're kind of ugly when they first come out of the ground they're, they're lifted up by volcanic action they're brought up to the surface where they can be mined uh, but they're made made in the depths of the earth and it, it just made me think about how people you know, uh, or just they're like kind of dark because of sin and they're, they're, good, they're good for a few things I mean they can do a few things but they're not like a diamond but the potential is there to be transformed by having just what we're made of, having it rearranged to become a brilliant diamond and to be polished and sharpened and cut and have the facets brought out so that we reflect and, and glory, uh, reflect lights like the glory of God. It's like people, isn't it? And the cataclysmic, the amazing events that makes this transformation happen is the resurrection. It's the cross and the resurrection. The, the pivotal point of history when the power that uh, raised Jesus from the dead and through Jesus we're transformed our atoms are realigned well, they can, our carbon atoms connect up differently and now suddenly we're not dark and soft and crumbly and only good for a few things we're brilliant and hard and enduring and of great value mm. And useful for God's purposes <coughs> and ready to be polished and cut into a fantastic shape that reflects glory that's what God does for us isn't it mm -hmm. an amazing thing this offer of grace come and dwell in the land with us <laughs> come and find an inheritance with us where you are is no good get transformed get turned into this brilliant creation realize your potential don't be stuck in that dark place in darkness so soft and breakable come and be made tough strong in the Lord in the power of his might it's a great offer isn't it Amen. Yeah. let's pray Lord I want to thank you that you've called us to be your people that we are your people called by your name that we are the ones who have received grace from you, that you have redeemed us, that you've set us on a path, you've made us different. We're born again, Lord God. 
we're transformed. We're changed through the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection. Father, it was you that was lowered into the earth, but we came out as violence. Mm -hmm. You're amazing, God. You're amazing. Father, help us to just uh, be transformed into your image, to serve you, to know you. Father, thank you for your grace to us. We want to dwell in the land that you've called us to, to know the blessing. It's for us, Lord. Help us to stand and take hold of it. Amen.